All right, guys, welcome back. This is the last lecture this term uh, for differential diagnosis. So hand and finger. So we'll do our best to get through. Of course, there's several diagnoses that are still out there. Again, these lectures are just going over probably the most common ones that you might see as an orthopedic or sports physical therapist. And um, the ones that, you know, you need to you need to know about. You need to be, be able to nail these. So, um, you know, as far as treatment goes, I'll just take a quick second, you know, the anywhere from elbow all the way down to wrist, hand, of course, finger, can and usually seen by a hand therapist, you know, certified hand therapist. And that's an extra credential you get you get um, post um, post doctorate. And uh, it's a very prestigious one. Uh, the hand and wrist are very complex. The fingers are very complex in terms of an anatomy. And having that extra training goes a long, long way. Now, the point of these lectures is to, to introduce you to the diagnoses and give you a very, very basic understanding of the pathology so you can start to think about how you would treat it. Uh, so with that said, let's uh, move on. So, uh, the objectives here, we're going to try to understand the following differential diagnoses. Inert tissues, we're going to look at the TFCC, which is the uh, triangular fibrocartilage complex. Uh, we'll talk about what that is, we'll get the anatomy of that. Uh, look at ligamentous injuries like a UCL sprain of the thumb, not to be confused with UCL sprain of the elbow, which we talked we'll talk a lot about previously. PIP dislocations and carpal instability. And then in terms of bony anatomy, we'll look at boxer's fracture, CMC osteoarthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis. For contractile, and some would argue that, by the way, RA is not bony, which, but, you know, we're going to put it into that category for, um, for lack of better categories, <laughs> essentially. So contractile tissues, uh, you know, we'll look at the two big tendon injuries. Uh, one's more of an extensor mechanism failure and one's a flexor mechanism failure. That's a mallet finger and jersey finger. And then, of course, um, we talked about in the last lecture how we go over Raynaud's syndrome. That's going to be a vascular issue. Now, we've gone over neurological conditions um, before, all the way from cervical radiculopathy down to our nerve entrapment syndromes, uh, all the way down to the wrist, right? So all of those neurological conditions will show um, symptoms or may show symptoms in the hand. And so you just got to remember those. But from a true vascular issue, you have Raynaud's. Um, you can also think of vascular TOS. We've touched on that in the shoulder differential section. Um, and I guess the only one we, we, we haven't really gone over and won't is complex regional pain syndrome, uh, which is something that can manifest in the hands or feet and kind of work its way proximally up the arm or up the leg. Uh, however, that's more of a neurological condition. And my hope is that you go over complex regional pain syndrome in the neuro section. Uh, it's, a, it's a psychosocial, psychosomatic, I should say, um, uh, condition, and it's a neurological condition, and it can have vascular implications as well. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an odd one, but it's one you'll see, and it's one that you guys should have in a different class. Okay, that's CRPS, Complex Regional Pain Syndrome. All right, so we'll move on. All right. So this anatomy picture should look familiar as in our wrist section as well. Uh, you can see the bones of the hand, and again, we'll look at uh, not only the carpals, but the digits as well, and the, ph the phalanx um, and uh, the metacarpal bones. Finger anatomy is very complex. Uh, you know, what, what I want you to appreciate here is these schematics show just the many layers of different types of tissues, from vascular tissue to ligamentous tissue to bony, you know, it goes down on and on to, to capsular tissue. Uh, just, I want you to appreciate how complex this is. And so the picture on the bottom left is looking at a hand, um, you know, palm up. So this would be the palmer side of a finger. Let's just call it the first finger. And uh, you can see the pulley mechanism here with these, um, these different tendons that essentially uh, interlace between each other, and those those create a pulley uh, pulley system of sorts to help you kind of incrementally close your hand, you know, your fingers to be able to wrap uh, and, and contract down like this. And it's a very very amazing 
um, anatomical structure. I mean, uh, it's just it's just really cool when you really dive into the anatomy. And if you look at the back side of the hand, you'll see the big the big tendon here. Um, well, well, you know, for each one of these, there's different names like your extensor indices, but you have your extensor digitorums as well that go up and dive deep um, to the you know, distal phalanx, and those help you, of course, incrementally extend your fingers. And so, um, not as complex, in my opinion, as the palmar side, but the dorsal side, very, very good as well. So, um, yeah, please just appreciate that. And then the top right, all these different letters, if you go into hand therapy one day, we um, try to differentiate different areas of the finger by talking about different zones. Uh, so we have A zones and C zones, and um, it's a little bit too much uh, above my scope uh, in terms of you know being more of a shoulder elbow PT, uh, but I know enough here to be dangerous. So uh, just understand that there's different zones and, and different injuries can, can occur in certain zones. And so, um, there's your introduction to that. All right, so inert tissues. Let's just go over a TFCC sprain. So TFCC, what is that? That's a triangular fibrocartilage complex that makes up those that acronym. Uh, description here: the TFCC is a fibrous and cartilaginous structure that separates the radiocarpal and an inferior radial ulnar joints of the wrist. It is a major ligamentous stabilizer of the distal radial ulnar joint and the ulnar carpus provides a flexible mechanism for stable rotation movements of the radiocarpal unit around the ulnar axis and cushions the forces transmitted through the ulnar carpal axis. It functions much like the meniscus in the knee. It's prone to cartilage tears and cause symptoms of wrist pain and clicking or catching sensation. And athletes are most often the ones who injure this, uh, usually through high torques or twisting or swinging bats or rackets, anything with high rotational um, forces under load. So uh, think of this as like we get into the knee section next next term, but if the knee as a hinger has an injury to where it twists, the meniscus inside can get sheared. And so the uh, same thing can happen here to this uh, TFCC. And if we look at um, this picture on the right, this uh, this picture may be just a little bit above where you guys are at in terms of cross-sectional uh, anatomy. But you have the distal ulna here, okay? The extensor carpi on there is sheath. The tendon actually will go through this uh, kind of half pipe looking structure here. You can see that on another picture. You have a couple different uh, ligaments here. The ulno lunate and the ulno triquetrum, I believe is, is, is what this is signifying. And then you have your disc, and this uh, light blue area is the disc. It's the triangle, uh, triangular fibrocartilage uh, disc, and it's surrounded by this uh, cartilage that um, is a meniscus homolog. And that just means that if we look at the cross section of a meniscus, it looks very similar to this. So, long story short, we can draw some comparisons and uh, similar injury. Uh, stresses, rotational, compression, high shear forces can create injury to this area, okay? So that's what I want you to understand there. Here's looking at the uh, a little different anatomical picture. If we, if we look at the picture on the left here, you can see the radius and the ulna, the distal ulna. If we go back one slide, you can see this is also the distal ulna. You can see the, the extensor carpi ulnaris uh, sheath is here that would be this, but obviously this is not more tubular than the cross section on the, on the last page, last slide. And again, here's the, here's the disc. So you can imagine how your, and by the way, here's those ligaments again, the ulno triquetral and the uh, ulno lunate ligaments that you can see on the previous slide as well. And so these all make up this complex that can get sheared or injured at the distal end of the ulna. And remember we talked about ulnar variants, how the radius is usually extends more distally than the ulna. The TFCC attempts to make up that distance so that um, you know the end of your ulna is extended essentially in length by the, the TFCC. 
and uh, unfortunately though it's soft tissue and it's not bone and so um, one that one good thing uh, is that it allows uh, the wrist to absorb some shock right and uh, it's it's a little bit of a, a cushion and it's more moldable flexible which allows for better range of motion in the wrist however it can sustain injuries that the distal radius doesn't because um, because you have this cartilaginous structure here. So we've kind of harped on the anatomy. So let's actually talk about the injury. So signs and symptoms, you're going to have pain along the ulnar side of the wrist. Wrist extension is difficult and painful, especially, of course, on the ulnar side. Maybe clicking um, or catching sensation when moving the wrist. And there may be swelling about the wrist as well. You're going to have decreased grip strength secondary to pain. You'll have difficulty with weight bearing through your hands or wrists secondary to pain. So loading through that that um, upper extremity will be difficult, especially the wrist in the extended position. Possible contributing causes will force hyperextension, as in falling on an outstretched hand that compresses the TFCC between the radial ulnar joint and the proximal row of carpal bones. Also may be a violent repetitive twisting of the wrist, such as racket sports or club sports or uh, like baseball, softball. The TFCC injury is often associated with sprain of the ulnar collateral ligament of the wrist as well. Differential diagnosis, you're going to think about arthritis maybe, uh, distal radial ulnar joint injury, technically this, this um, you know, is, is very close to that, chondral injury, fractures, we think of hookup hamate or pisiform fractures, maybe ganglion cyst. There's also co something called Kindbox disease, which we won't get into in this lecture, but that's avascular necrosis of the lunate. We did talk about um, the, sc the uh, scaphoid bone last lecture. Um, how that can become, uh, how that can undergo avascular necrosis if that fracture is not diagnosed. This is something a little different, but similar pathology. So we're just thinking proximal row of carpals and injury to to a, to a bone. So kind box disease one, intercarpal ligament injury. So this would be an intercarpal sprain. Extensor carpi ulnaris tendonitis is another one. And you can appreciate the ECU on some of those anatomy pictures. So don't want to rule out. Uh, ECU tendonitis. So what do we do for tests, special tests here? Well, you have the TFCC press test, which is the top right picture where you're just going to have the person try to push out of the chair. This also looks very similar to your push-off test for lateral elbow instability. Remember the LCL complex of the elbow? We do a very similar test. Also, we, we have a test called the piano key test, and that's the bottom right picture. So you'll press on the distal ulna and uh, that force may cause discomfort. And then the ulnar impaction test, so that's the picture on the left where you're applying the patient's elbows flexed to 90, they're pronated, you take them into ulnar deviation, you apply axial compression um, to stress the TFCC area and you rotate. So that would be very similar to maybe a Thessaly's test in, um, in the meniscus, uh, for the meniscus. So we'll go over that next term. All right, ligamentous injury, thumb sprain. This is a UCL sprain, also known as skier's thumb, gamekeeper's thumb, breakdancer's thumb, and you'll see why in a second. But essentially, it's a tear of the, the UCL or a sprain of the UCL that holds the metacarpal bone and the uh, proximal phalanx together. And so this is an area where people will get, um, you know, if your thumb gets hyper extended, uh, or hyper abducted, then this ligament can become injured. And it's uh, pretty common actually. It's injury, injury to the MCP joint, most common ligament injury of the hand, and it typically occurs when a radial, radially um, directed impact forces the thumb into abduction and hyperextension. And if you look at an example here on the right, you can see uh, someone either falling on their hand. This kind of looks like someone's break dancing, doesn't it? So um, they come down, axial load through the length of the arm, the thumb hyperextends or hyper uh, abducts, and you get this uh, uh, pivot point right here at the uh, MCP joint, and uh, this ligament tears. I actually have this injury. Uh, I played uh, baseball growing up and slid headfirst in the second base, and much like Mike Trout who sustained, sustained a thumb injury as well, uh, we're definitely not the same player. He's, he's, of course, uh, not as good as me, 
Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but very com very common injury here. Um, and people have to slide or reach for things, so sliding into a base, for instance. And essentially what it is, right, is you know, I hold my hands up. If you can see, um, let's see here. So if I take my right, my right hand, and I pull back, my thumb only goes a certain distance, right? If I pull my left thumb back, it goes much further. And so I've got <laughs> joint laxity there. Uh, again, compared to this side, and then this side. And that's actually one of the special tests that we'll go over in a second here is you have hyper mobility there, um, greater than 35 degrees. And, and uh, if so, that we suspect that. But signs and symptoms, deformity, maybe swelling, pain, tenderness, palpation, instability and weakness during pinching, and pain with gripping and other daily tasks, of course. And you'll know right away. I mean, it just hurts right, right deep in the joint there. So um, management considerations. Because the stability of pinching can be severely deterred, proper immediate and follow-up care must be performed. Uh, the thumb is one of the most important pieces of anatomy on your body. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of what makes... Human special, right, is an opposable thumb, and so if that gets injured, then uh, you really need to take care of that. X-ray exam should be performed to rule out any fractures, like an avulsion fracture. A thumb splint should be applied uh, for protection for three weeks or until the thumb is pain-free. The splint extending from the end of the thumb to above the wrist, because we don't want to get uh, wrist movement in there that might uh, make the thumb move. Uh, if there is a complete tear of the ligament, surgical repair is necessary to uh, allow for normal return of function. You want to differentially diagnose a thumb fracture and a scapular fracture. Tests and measures here. So special tests, you're going to do the thumb UCL stress test, and that would be kind of indicative of the, the uh, picture at the top of the page. You can have them, this is the same one, like a bite and score test, right? Can you hold your thumb and you know, push your thumb and touch your wrist? Uh, the other one is a thumb valgus stress test. So remember the elbow valgus stress test. Uh, you can do this to the thumb as well. And so essentially, you, you're trying to stabilize the uh, distal row of the carpals. Uh, how should I put this? You're trying to stabilize the hand. Okay. So take them to a little bit of an extension position, and then you provide this shear force here. Uh, kind of this valgus stress. You can see this angulation, so it goes up and then down, and you're trying to create that valgus stress on the thumb. Let's talk about carpal instabilities next. We'll move away from the thumb and just talk about the, the carpal bones. So any injury to the intercarpal ligaments that creates instability uh, between two or more carpal bones is known as carpal instability. The scapholunate articulation and the scapholunate ligament is the most common area for this pathology. Uh, the integrity of the carpal relationship depends on the stability provided by both the interosseous ligaments and the midcarpal ligaments, and this ensures that the carpal bones move as a unit. Disruption of this relationship allows abnormal independent motion of one or two carpal bones, and uh, you know, in terms of treatment, conservative intervention for carpal instabilities usually involve a trial period of cast immobilization to see if those ligaments scar down and create some sort of natural um, uh, stability, otherwise surgery uh, is reserved for chronic cases. So mechanism of injury is a hyperextension of the wrist during a foosh. Signs and symptoms, patient frequently complains that the pain is aggravated by weight bearing uh, on the wrist and a physical exam is often limited, but there should be swelling, uh, deformity, tenderness. Easily, It's easily reduced uh, if the intervention occurs soon after the injury, so, the, so reduction involves placing, this is a reduction of the, um, the instability, involves placing the wrist in extension and putting pressure on the lunate after which the wrist is moved into flexion and immobilized, meaning, um, you know, if, if you have a scaphoid lunate uh, dislocation, I should say, or uh, instability between those two bones, place the wrist in extension, put pressure on the lunate, flex the wrist, it should um, stabilize, and then you immobilize it in that position. We take a look here at the carpal ligaments. Um, again, here's the scaphoid and here's the lunate. This is the ligament that's most in question, but carpal instability can occur between any of these ligaments. This is the most common. 
what happens is on x-ray if that ligament's torn the relationship between these bones starts to um, diverge and you get this um, empty space I forget this gentleman's name um, but this picture always comes up uh, Tim Terry maybe uh, well before my time um, so don't know but it's called a Tim Terry sign I think is what it's called and of course you can see why is because the gap tooth looks very similar to um, the scapholunate ligament um, instability so uh, there you have it what do you do for differential well I think maybe distal radius fracture because of the mechanism and the location of pain maybe a ligament sprain which this is but maybe it's just a grade one or two instead of a complete rupture which is a grade three maybe a carpal fracture like a scaphoid fracture a lunate fracture or something like that tests and measures you're gonna do the Watson test which is also known as the scaphoid shift test I want you to please read Dutton for that um, and then pivot shift test in the mid carpal joints you can also read Dutton for more info on that the last thing here with uh, kind of the inert uh, ligamentous tissues is PIP dislocation. So dislocations of the phalanges have a high rate of occurrence. The mechanism that produces a PIP dislocation is hyperextension that produces a disruption of the volar plate at the middle phalanx. The, the volar plate is thick fibrocartilage ligament that is part of the anterior joint capsule. It forms the floor of the PIP joint and separates the joint space from the flexor tendons. And so when you jam your finger or hyperextend it, uh, bad things happen. Uh, it gets torn. You can see the x-ray on the right. Obviously the finger in question is the fifth finger. You can see the proximal interphalangeal joint uh, is not where it should be. Um, see how this angulation there. So I want to just warn you if, if you want to uh, turn away for a second, uh, if you don't like seeing um, messed up fingers, but um, in about three seconds, I'm going to click the button and we're going to look at some pictures of it. Ready? Go. All right. Here's a couple pictures of what it really looks like in real life of um, finger dislocations. And so these can be quite, um, for me, nauseating to see. Uh, just something very troubling about the appearance of these. But these happen quite frequently. And I've seen several in the field, not only as an athlete, but also covering events. And... Um, uh, it's something athletic trainers can try to reduce and if you don't feel comfortable reducing it then of course send these people refer them right away to urgent care orthopedic urgent care or um, or the you know, hopefully not the ER but if there's an orthopedic urgent care around um, you should know where those are at they can help uh, relocate these um, and then follow up with a hand specialist after this occurs there's uh, there's disruption to sometimes disruption to um, some of the tendons and so you may need surgery to help correct it so it needs to be seen by a hand specialist afterwards hand, hand or orthopod all right good let's talk about bony injury so boxer's fracture somebody in the class might have this um, it's pretty common actually it's uh it's common with people who uh, have been in fights or mma or have been upset and punched a wall, uh, you know, things like that. That's probably actually the most common is, you know, the, the teenager who gets dumped um, and then punches a wall because they're so upset, you know, how to manage their emotions, and then they fracture the fifth uh, uh, metacarpal. And so that's what this is, the fifth metacarpal fracture. And you can see the artist's rendition here of the fracture in the mid shaft of the metacarpal as well as the actual um, radiograph at the bottom. And so signs and symptoms, patients can complain of pain and swelling. It's a pretty common, um, you know, pretty obvious mechanism. Hey, I punched a wall. Now it hurts right here. So kind of right in the shaft. You can also get this in the fourth uh, metacarpal, but it's more common in the fifth. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's not, there's not too many differentials here um, based on the mechanism as well as uh, the location of pain. So you treat this conservatively, um, you try to splint them. Initially, you do pain management techniques, ice, um, you know, for pain, uh, pain medications if needed because it is a fracture, we get an NCA hand specialist, they'll get immobilized. In bad cases, what you'll, what you'll get is an ORIF, uh, which you can see here. 
right? or, or maybe a chronic non-union that just never heals on its own might need surgery. This is what the splint looks like, the cast slash splint, it's not really cast, but it's just, you know, some sort of immobilization device. They're going to, you know, you think about um, trying to stabilize above and below this area, so they're stabilizing some of the joints of the finger, right, the MCP joint, the fracture is right here, they're stabilizing the, the carpals, and they're sta stabilizing the radial uh, carpal, uh, radial, radial ulnar and carpal interface as well. So we're not getting any movement of the hand rotationally. You certainly can't load through this. Um, so we're really protecting uh, that area. Moving on in bony uh, differentials here is CMC osteoarthritis. And this is the most common form of OA is with the CMC joint of all places. And that's the carpal metacarpal um, joint of the, of the, basically the base of the thumb. So commonly affects hand and weight-bearing joints. That's just OA in general. Uh, also affects interphalangeal joints and first uh, metatarsophalangeal joints. So of course the foot. The birds talk generally about OA. And um, OA is associated with increasing age, obesity, gender, race, ethnicity, associated with abnormal loading of the joints, characterized by joint pain. And um, you may know this is degenerative joint disease, DJD. General considerations here is um, it's usually caused by repetitive joint use or loading. Sometimes I always think of like the bank teller who's counting money every day, right? Just that repetitive wrist flick, thumb press, right? Something like that. Or um, someone in um, managerial position that might be doing a lot of paperwork where they've got to lift the thumb and flip the page or something. You know, that's kind of how I think of it. Also, PTs get this a lot. You know, we're doing soft tissue work a lot. If we're not careful. We can start to get, you know, repetitive loading through the thumb, and we, this can, this area can be affected. So, you guys need to be careful with that as well. So, demographics. Of course, the older you are, the more common OA is, especially in the thumb. Women are more affected than men. African American more so, or, or, and Caucasian are are uh, African American and Caucasian population are affected uh, more so than other um, ethnicities, and then may affect about 12% of the population. Uh, that's that's OA in general. Signs and symptoms, joint pain, aching joint, joint stiffness, muscle weakness, muscle atrophy, crepitus, bony enlargement. You can see where we're going with this. Uh, signs and symptoms of uh, joint dysfunction. And with joint dysfunction comes uh, self-immobilization and with that comes some of the muscle weakness and atrophy and stuff like that. And, and that just perpetuates on itself with stiffness and things of that nature. So you can see uh, the carpal, uh, metacarpal joint here of the thumb, how there's no joint space uh, preserved. Um, you're getting this kind of higher density white um, section, which is just showing, uh, well, we won't get into the, we won't get into the, We'll get into that more when we talk about MRIs, but this is just kind of a sign of um, irregularity with the, within the bone, and um, you can see it better on MRI, but this it's almost like end plates of the bone are affected, uh, which gives you this kind of higher uh, density signal, if you will. Uh, this looks more white. So you can see bone spurs coming off, and... Uh, and there you go. I mean, that's that doesn't look great. So you can picture here if we go back a few slides. So think about that X-ray. Go back to that picture here. Can you guys appreciate that X-ray now by looking here? How you can have some abnormal bone growth here and here, which gives this appearance. I think so. Possible contributing causes: age, chronic and vigorous joint loading, um, previous chronic joint injury. So maybe you had. Uh, an injury to this area, you know, I'm worried myself when I talk about my thumb, right, this is actually one joint higher, but I'm afraid at, at some point in time as a PT, I'm doing manual, that I'll get away, I probably already do in this joint a little bit, we're talking about this joint here though, uh, of, this, of the thumb, which is basically um, where the skateboard articulates in with the, uh, the thumb, I believe it's skateboard, so anyways, tests and measures here, we have your grind test and your CMC lever test. And uh, these are both in Dutton as well. As you can see you add, with the grind test, you add axial compression. 
and then you move them into you know um, some extension and flexion. You, you're basically trying to grind or shear that joint and see if that it's aggravating. Makes sense, right, for OA? And then the lever test, which is basically going to be just um, various valgus stress testing uh, of that joint. And this is not remember, this is not here. Okay, this is down here further. So I don't know if I can kind of show you on my so I'll show you on my picture. It's here. Right? Here. Not here. Not where it, like the thumb articulates with the palm. It's it's more proximal than that. Don't get those confused. It happens every year. Alright, we'll we'll then jump into rheumatoid arthritis. And we're just talking about OA, we'll talk about rheumatoid. And this really rheumatoid arth arthritis is a um, it's a very complex for at least for me, okay? It's a very complex diagnosis. There's a lot of different things that you need to take into account with someone with RA. One um, is it's an autoimmune disease, okay? So multiple joints of your body will be affected simultaneously. We worry about people with RA with things like cervical spine instability. We worry about people with RA with um, uh, pictures as you can see here is hand deformities. And um, really what I need you guys to do is go to chapter 5 in Dutton and spend a little time reading about rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, the reason this is in the hand lectures is because I think of all areas, um, unfortunately RA affects a ton of areas of the body, but I think some of the most debilitating is the, is the hand because um, it creates essentially deformities of the hand and uh, renders them useless um, in some individuals and uh, it's, it's, it's a little heartbreaking because it's autoimmune and um, there's high rates of depression people with RA, advanced RA um, versus individuals without RA and it's because of situations like this where their, their, their function is um, their function can be greatly affected. So um, it's amazing though, I've worked with a few, how resilient they are and how much they work their butts off to get better. So I will say that. So um, anyways, what you'll notice here is these pictures and you can see these nodules um, that form uh, within the joints, the VIP joints and you know some of the other joints of the hand. And you'll also notice that they generally have this uh, ulnar deviation of the hand. And this is called an ulnar, it's called the ulnar sweep. This picture of this individual, bottom right picture, the, the right hand, they've had surgery to correct the ulnar sweep. You can see this incision area. And so many times, uh, you know, the, the hand becomes so, for lack of a better term, deformed that surgical uh, interventions are required for function. Signs and symptoms of RA, pain, stiffness, joint damage, instability, ultimately deformity. Ulnar drift is uh, what we talked about in the, the previous slide. There's two types of deformities that are very common that can happen to the, to the fingers. Uh, one is called a boutonniere deformity and one is called a swan neck deformity. Um, I always think of boutonniere, uh, so, so we'll talk about those two individually. But boutonniere always reminds me of like trying to button my shirts. That's like kind of how my finger goes into. And of course you can see what a swan neck looks like. A swan neck, I can't do it with my fingers here, but swan neck looks like a swan's neck. Um, so, so easy enough to remember those two. Uh, but good test question is what joints are flex, what joints are extended? Hey, just a heads up on that one. So in severe RA there's high level depression which is two to four times increased compared to those without RA. Difficult, uh, difficulty with manipulating things um, with the hands. We, we talked about that. Here's the boutonniere and swan neck deformity. So in a boutonniere deformity, you have uh, flexion of the PIP joint and hyperextension of the DIP joint. In a swan neck deformity, that's, that's flipped. You have flexion of the DIP and extension of the PIP. So um, two things to, to understand there.
This uh, slide is basically tables from a study, um, or should I say a chapter in a book rather, uh, by Dr. Uh, Ryan Fleisch of the University of Wisconsin, Diagnosis and Management of RA. And so uh, differential diagnosis, is, since this is differential diagnosis, here's table two, which um, is going over differential diagnosis of RA. And then table one, if I move my picture here. This is basically signs and symptoms, right? And the uh, likelihood ratios, positive and negative, of those with RA versus um, uh, of having RA, essentially. So morning stiffness, arth arthritis of three or more joints, hand joint involvement, symmetric arthritis, rheumatoid nodules, um, serum rheumatoid factor is positive, and it's a blood draw and radiographic changes noted on, on x-rays. All right, so this lecture is going a little long, but um, I promise we're, we're almost done. Contractile tissue injuries, we're gonna go over mallet finger and jersey finger. I think we have three more diagnoses, and we'll try to roll through them, okay guys? So mallet finger is uh, distal joint of the finger is bent into a claw-like position, it's usually due to trauma from impact on the tip of the finger. Think. Think of jamming your finger, like trying to catch a basketball. The basketball hits, hits the tip of your finger and it jams it. So um, what happens here is the extensor mechanism of the distal, uh, the DIP, or the distal phalanx rather, is, is injured. That tendon is ruptured. So you'll get this kind of uh, mallet finger deformity. If we look at here, this is the most recent, is Russell Wilson. It's probably the most, most uh, recent popular individuals had this happen. You can see the middle finger there. Uh, I think what he did was he threw a ball, if I'm not mistaken, his finger hit the tip of the, his own player's helmet, his own lineman's helmet, and it got jammed. And uh, Essentially what happened is this uh, tendon evolves off that bone, and then so you just lose the ability to extend this the tip of the bone because the tendon is no longer attached. And so you just do not have access to extend. And, so if we look at my right uh, fourth finger here, you can see how straight it goes. I actually have a mallet finger on this side that was never fixed. As you can see the difference in my two fingers. And so I have passive motion there. But as soon as I let go, it just flops. So that's what it is. I never had this fixed. I was like 13 when this happened. Didn't want to tell my mom. You know, my finger was hurting, didn't want to tell my coach. I basically caught a football, jammed it, and um, should have told someone. <laughs> no, I can't extend that, that joint. But, live and you learn. Essentially, what happens if you tear this, they splint you uh, with the hope that you can see this finger splint. It usually wears for like 12 weeks, by the way. It gets this joint back in position, stabilizes it so the bony ends, the, the avulsion fracture here, which is basically this bone is chipped off of and is still attached to the tendon, uh, you approximate these two edges, hopefully there's um, some bony healing, which allows you then to extend the time. The jersey finger is just the opposite. Um, it's a rupture of the flexor digitorum profundus tendon from its insertion on the distal phalanx, so it's the bowler side injury. Often occurs when the ring finger and this is usually because someone's trying to grab someone's jersey and um, uh, basically this injury occurs that way as you're grabbing onto something and then it gets pulled into extension forcefully and that's where you'll have uh, a disruption of the, uh, the FDP tendon. So this is what that looks like. Picture on the left, this is one of the special tests for that. You just ask the individual, can you, can you flex all your uh, phalangeal joints and if one doesn't flex it stays open maybe because that tendon's ruptured that makes sense and then finally Raynaud's syndrome some of you may have this and um, good thing you live in uh, Arizona because uh, cold temperature climates can can cause this more more so than um, warm temperature climates like Arizona but vasospasm, it's basically vasospasm of the arteries of the distal extremities, the most common in the fingers and toes, can affect the nose, ears, lips, 
Um, it is a cold sensitivity issue. So primary Raynaud's etiology is unknown, and that's actually more common. Secondary Raynaud's may be due to things like connective tissue disease, obstructive arterial disease, neuro disorders, drugs and toxins, or occupational environmental exposure issues. So cold temperature can cause a Raynaud attack when there's a brief period of little to no blood flow into the digits. Brief temperature changes can cause an attack and uh, cause skin, skin sores and um, eventually gain green if you don't get out of the appropriate um, that, if you don't get out of that environment or climate. Demographics affects about 10% of the population. Primary Raynaud's begins before age 30. Secondary begins after age 30. Women are more likely than men, 4 to 1 ratio. Uh, usually family history and living in cold regions is a uh, higher diagnosis here. So this is what it looks like. I mean, it's, it's pretty apparent when it happens, right? It's like lack of blood flow to certain digits or um, areas of the hand. So signs and symptoms include throbbing, tingling, burning, decreased sensation, you know, those things we'd expect with vascular issues. Functional implications here, uh, severe symptoms may cause inability to leave home in the winter, limit fine finger dexterity, limited range of motion, ADLs, uh, lifestyle changes, secondary pain and fatigue. Possible contributing causes. Some may, some say, physical or emotional stress or anxiety. Uh, some immunological conditions. Medication side effects can cause vasoconstriction. Toxin or chemical exposure can damage um, the vessels. Diseases that damage arteries or nerves um, that control the arteries. And RA, atherosclerosis, cryoglobulinemia, which again. It's a little above my pay grade. Uh, Sogren syndrome, which actually you guys should look that one up. Thyroid problems, work hazards, like excessive vibration. So maybe um, like jackhammer, things like that. And frostbite, of course frostbite is very obvious. Differential, you want to look at carpal tunnel because we have the tingling of the hand. TOS. We'll get into some of the other stuff that um, is, is a little less orthopedic, like chronic fatigue syndrome, Sogren syndrome, vasculitis, RA. And uh, there you go. This is the this is the hand and finger. So sorry, it's been a little long. Um, uh, this is the last lecture that I'm doing for this term. So I appreciate you guys very much. And um, again, any emails, or questions, the hand and finger section. Uh, just to recap, is a little less um, for for the first year student. It's it's a lot of good to know information. Uh, if you want to do more hand and, hand and digit PT one day, you can specialize in this. And so um, I just need you guys to know the big, the big picture stuff and uh, diving much deeper into the treatments and the intervention stuff I think is a little later in your career. So um, if you do have questions, please email me. I uh, appreciate you guys so much. Thanks for letting me be a part of this term. And I really hope to work with you next term as well with lower extremity. Thanks.